Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. We're looking at zealous of the law. These being the last words of verse number 20. Kind of an important, odd, eye-catching verse to look at. Let's look at verse 19 and then read verse 20 and see what the Lord has for us this afternoon. And when he, Paul, had, <coughs> had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither, neither to walk after their customs. Zealous. It comes the word from the word moved with envy in Acts chapter 7 and verse 9 and Acts chapter 17 and verse 5. It's those who are moved with envy. It is the word, uh, comes from the word covet in 1 Corinthians 14 and 39. It comes from the word desire to have in James chapter 4 and verse 2. And in all of these uh, grandpa words that this is derived from, you see the moving uh, of, of the spirit in the heart. Uh, moving to envy, covet, desire to have, and uh, so it is a uh, it, it is a, a, a powerful agent, uh, whether it is used for bad or for good. But how do we deal with an an, uh, an illegal zeal, a zeal of the law, a zeal of legalism? Let's let the apostle Paul speak to us in Galatians one fourteen, and then we'll look at him again in Acts. 22 Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14 we'll see him on both sides of this thing and it will help us understand how we are to deal with a negative zeal of the law Galatians 1 14 and profited in the Jews religion please notice he's not talking about Christianity he's talking about traditional Judaism practicing that uh, down through his life and profited in the Jews religion above mine equals in mine own nation listen being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father so these men were zealous of the law but the apostle Paul at one time was exceedingly more zealous than they were now how did he handle it Acts 22 and verse number 3 Exceedingly more zealous of the law. Now, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, Paul's standing on the stairs uh, there where the Lord Jesus Christ stood when the crowd cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And he's saying in the Hebrew tongue to them in Acts 22 and verse 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this, in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of our fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day. There was a turning of his heart and mind from being zealous of the law to being zealous of God. That's what we need. You know, I look at uh, serpents, and that coral snake is just beautiful. I mean, I don't want to be anywhere close to him. If you got one, I don't want to come in the room with him. But those yellows and reds and blacks and those bright colors he got are just beautiful. And that was left over from before the curse. I don't know what the serpent was, but prior to the curse, he was so articulate and he was so attractive to uh to satan uh and to uh the human kind uh, to eve that he was the one that was picked out to be used but then god put a curse on him for being used of the devil to bring down god's creation but my point is this there was left over from 
that curse, those bright colors. Dear soul, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bath water. When you get saved, there are some things that God will sanctify and bless and bring over and use for the glory of God. And being zealous uh, for the law and being legal and being uh, prejudiced and uh, self-centered and, and critical of everything everybody else does, that's not good. But you take that zeal and it gets sanctified and you become zealous for God. Isn't that a great thing? Don't you want to have zeal for the glory of God? I do. So we don't have to lose zeal, but we do have to conquer it and bring it under the usage of the Holy Spirit. That's how you deal with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, uh, it begins to tell us that we have weapons to be able to do this. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare, those who walk after the Spirit, do have weapons, and it is a warfare, are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds does it pull down? Casting down imaginations and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see that there is a bringing down of false imaginations, but there's a bringing over of thoughts uh, and bringing them under a sanctified work of the Holy Spirit so that they might serve Christ. I don't want to just quit thinking and be like a dumb stump. I want to still be able to think and to have imagination, but I want it to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. How bleak would it be in the Christian life if you had no sanctified imagination? What is your consciousness of God in prayer? It comes through a sanctified imagination. It comes through seeing what God has said of himself in the scriptures and the character of God formed in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And it's like we shared that verse, 2 Corinthians 4.18 uh, this morning with our sister. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, a Christian has to look at the things which are not seen. Well, how can you look at things not seen without an imagination? So the imagination is not evil, but if it is a false imagination and evil imaginations, and the heart, the unregenerate heart can't bring anything to the mind except evil imaginations. But when God saves us, conquers us, it's up to us to get grace into effect in every part of our consciousness. And we cast down those old imaginations and bring thoughts into the obedience of Christ. I'll tell you what will help you with your stinking thinking. Go straight from the hog pen to the Father's arms. You will be embarrassed. It's good for you. When I do that, I'm embarrassed. It's good for me. It brings humility. And I don't start sewing fig leaves together and trying to cover it up. I go immediately into the Father's presence and say, Lord, I don't know where that thought came from, but I was ready to entertain it in my flesh. But I don't like that. And I would rather, if you would help me, let me slay that thing and bring it back into the obedience of Christ. If you will not have any thought but those thoughts which you can have in the presence and the consciousness of God... It will progress you mightily in your sanctification, in your growth. Try it. Don't let any thought come in your head but what you don't bring it to God. But what you don't. That is really stupid language, isn't it? But that you, anyhow, bring it to Christ, okay? All right. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12. For as much, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Don't throw your zeal out, but bring it to the place where your zeal 
it is uh, it tempered with the desire to edify and build up the church of Christ. He goes on to say, let all things be done unto edification. The last sentence in verse 26 of this chapter. So don't do away with zeal, but ask the Holy Spirit to help you to Christianize that zeal. Have a zeal for God and have a zeal for the building up of those who are in the faith, your brothers and sisters in Christ. So he tells us in verse uh, what is it? Chapter 12 and verse 31. Here it is. But covet earnestly the best gifts. That's, you've got to have a zeal to do that. Covet earnestly the best gifts. Why? Why? That you might be able to edify and build up the rest of the church and have that kind of a zeal before the Lord. So that's what the Apostle Paul saw that happened to him. He had a zeal towards God. That replaced his zeal towards the tradition of his fathers. Now I want us to know something about the characteristic of legalism. I want us to just spend our time this afternoon looking at the characteristics of legalism. In chapter 21, verses 19 through 20, we have read it several times. And you see how Paul in verse 19 brings forth that which has been on his mind, that which has been in his spirit, but it's fixing to be absolutely just thrown out the window and they're going to go in a completely different direction. And uh, as Brother Mike <coughs> Conrad reminded me this afternoon, we are in the, in the time of Paul's ministry where he is on the defense now. That's where he is. He's got to go in Jerusalem and defend everything he's done. He's not on the offense out there preaching the gospel where no other man has ever gone. And so here he is. He's going to be on the defense of this thing because in chapter 21 and verse 20, they said unto him, astounding what comes out of their mouth after he has brought this. I'm telling you, it had to be a tremendous message of summing up everything that happened to him on his previous missionary journeys. And so I want you to see that uh, legalism uses slander from prejudice. He says in verse number 20, uh, 21, and when and they are informed of thee, we have been indoctrinated that word they were informed they are informed is it is to indoctrinate or to catechize this can't be stressed too strongly folks these people had made it their business to see everything paul did in a negative way and to stand against him in every way they could this was prejudice against the gentiles this was a prejudice against the work of the Holy Spirit. This was a refusing and a trying, excuse me, let me finish my sentence. This is a refusing of the tearing down of the middle wall of partition between Jew and the Gentile. It was a trying to build it back up every time the Holy Spirit would tear it down and say there's only one church. They would want to build it back up and say no. There's the elite church, the Jews, and then there's the rest of y'all down in the basement, the Gentiles. And uh, so we see that they were indoctrinated. It's the word catechize. That's how strong it is. They are informed to indoctrinate. It comes from two words. One word in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, sound. There was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. The other one is in Acts 21 and 21, and it is the word among you see it in verse 21 there, among. So it is a sounding among in order to indoctrinate and to catechize all of Jerusalem about Paul. Paul is standing here in the defense of the gospel almost as a lone figure to defend everything God has done through him at this point. But legalism comes against him to slander him for those glorious things that we think he did, glorious things. He did wonderful things. He, it was amazing what all he did. 
and yet they're prejudiced, saw it all in a light of slander and came up against him. It had to be slandered. Romans uh, 13 and verse 7. Romans 13 and verse 7. They had to be slandered. It wasn't the Apostle Paul they was talking about. Because this is how he was. Listen at Romans 13, 7. Render therefore to all their dues. What are you talking about? Tribute to him, troop to him, troop to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Listen, render to all their dues. If you owe the Roman government taxes, pay it. Jesus paid his taxes. Uh, do what you're supposed to do. I'm not opposed to anything or anybody in the structure of God's designated order of civil government, spiritual government, whatever it may be. I am for doing things honorably in the sight of all men. I'm not what you say I am. So they had to slander him to be able to bring these charges against him. It just wasn't true. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is, re this is rehearsal. We refer to these verses this morning. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I may gain the more. I am free to not do or to do. I am an apostle. But in that, I have obligated myself to serve all men's souls. Here we go. Verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. That's the, uh, that's the key to understanding Paul going into the temple for the purification ceremony with the four men that had the vow. Unto the Jew I became as a Jew. Why did you do that? That I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, I became as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. But to them that are without law, as without law. But I want you to know this. I am not without law to God, but I am under the law to Christ. And the reason that I became as without the law and the ceremonial customs is that I might gain them that are without the law. And it goes on. To the weak I became weak and so forth. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. I want you in on this thing. It is so precious to me. I want you to know it. And I will lose my identity as a Jew to become acting like a Gentile so you can know Christ. Or I will not take the liberties that I have uh, that I uh, present to the Gentile church. I will come back under the law and bind myself under vows and go into the temple and purify myself with you in order to help you come to know Jesus Christ and enjoy the blessings of God with me. This is an amazing man. In order to bring all of this against him, it had to be prejudice slandering him. And it comes from legalism. Second thing, legalism cannot be persuaded with innocence. It don't matter if you didn't do it. If you don't go by their rules, you are going to get slandered. It doesn't make any difference how often you present yourself as innocent. It's not going to work. The brother just mentioned when I were talking about how after this, no matter how perfectly Paul uh, conducted himself, everything continued to go from bad to worse. He winds up strapped on a Roman table in the fortress with a centurion that ain't no private. I mean, that's not a sergeant, that ain't no lieutenant, that ain't no. This man was in charge of a thousand soldiers 
and and the guy that came down to get him out out of out of the crowd, uh, he was in charge of numerous centurions. These guys were serious. They had him strapped to a table, and it says throngs, and had him stripped and ready to interrogate him with torture. That's what they said we're going to do. We'll find out the bottom of this because we're going to beat him till he tells us the truth. It it got. It got bad, but bad was good compared to the worse it got. So no matter how innocent he was, you can't persuade legalism with innocence. It won't work. Do you remember David in the land of the Philistines and he got scared that they were going to kill him? Do you remember what he did? He feigned himself as a madman. And he scrabbled on the wall, wrote crazy stuff on the walls of the Philistine city, and he let his spittle fall down on his beard like he was crazy, goofy, uh, insane person. It didn't work. It didn't distract him. You can't distract demons. There's only one that can handle demons, and that's Jesus Christ. And dear soul, until he is ready to get them off of you, you're stuck with them. And ain't no sense in trying to say, well, I didn't do it. Just stand up and be like a man. Shut your mouth. Keep your mouth closed. Don't argue with them. The minute you open your mouth, they use it against you. I don't know where to say this or not. Bitter, last order deal, personal order deal I had like this, I did not answer one single email. Not one. You can't find a word anywhere that I answered one single charge against. You say, well, goody, goody, goody. No, I ain't saying that because I'm good. I'm telling you because I finally learned you ain't going to do nothing by trying to give them your viewpoint. And the maddest I've ever seen anybody get about these kinds of things was years ago when a pastor's son took it upon himself to destroy my reputation. He, he's got me on the, uh, I think it's still on the internet, look up outside the camp. And I'm listed in the hall of shame as an apostate. He would send me letters. And I was stupid enough to open them and read them. But I finally said, wait a minute. I got to have a mind that's pure and separate and in the scriptures for these people. I've got, I don't belong with this one man. I am turning, the devil is turning me to just focus on that one man. I got to quit this. The last letter I got from him, I wrote on it, refused. And turned it back into the post office. They mailed it back to him. They said he went ballistic. You're not going to do me this way. They want somebody to argue with. The devil won't let up on you. I found a verse. No, I didn't. The Lord showed me a verse. Jesus Christ being in control of principalities and powers, angels and principalities being subject unto him. And I grabbed that verse and I went into my prayer closet and I, as they used to say, rang the bells of heaven quoting that verse to him and said, Lord, you're in control of these demons. Get them off of me. Help me that I will learn to live like I should and listen. Thank you for deaf ears. Let my inner ear be deaf to all the slandering of the devil because anything I do trying to be right is not going to affect them. They don't care about innocence. They want to argue and to slander you. It's of the devil. Um, we read you 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20. I'm not going to reread it to you. Let me remind you what it said. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Paul was completely impartial to either side. Didn't make any difference. They still said, and the charges were, Thou, uh, th thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not circumcise their children. That's not true. He never told one Jewish believer to abandon Moses. He's told them to close with Christ. 
And he never told one Gentile believer that they had to embrace Moses. He just said they had to embrace Christ. He didn't try to make Jews out of Gentiles or Gentiles out of Jews. But it didn't matter that he was innocent. The slander is coming anyhow. Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. Paul was impartial to both uh, circumcision and uncircumcision. Acts 16.1. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. He was impartial to it. He preaches against circumcision as being a way to come to God. But yet he would have Timothy to be circumcised because he doesn't want the gospel to be hindered. I will not reread you Acts 18, 18 that I read you this morning. Paul shaved his head because he had a vow. But look at chapter 21 and verse 26. Reminds you of this. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering should be offered for every one of them. So the apostle Paul used circumcision when circumcision was necessary so that Timothy, whose father was a Greek, would not be hindered in preaching to Jews. He himself shaved his own head in chapter 18 and verse 18 and here he goes into the temple and uh, enters into sanctification with these four men that had a vow. And it just goes back to that 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Under the Jew, I became as a Jew. Unto those who are without law, I became as. You need to watch that word as in these, these verses. I became as a Jew. I acted like they needed me to act. Dear soul, you, you need to present yourself in the way that's most beneficial to that person receiving the gospel. It's not compromise. It's becoming all things to all men that I may win some to Christ. When he went on Mars Hill, he didn't say, you bunch of idiots. You're stupid. He said, you know that unknown God you've got right there? I'm going to preach about him. What? Boy, Billy Graham would have had a fit if he heard Paul say that. You know, some, some super-duper evangelist said, you can't go in there and do that. you you gotta, you got to trash their gods and tell them they got to throw away all that stuff. And he said, that God right there y'all ignorantly worship. I want to tell you more about him. He preaches God. Isn't that amazing? So to the Athenians, he becomes as, not becomes an Athenian, but as. An, he uses what's necessary in order to bring them to Christ. Let me ask you something. Is God sovereign? Be careful now. Is that selective sovereignty? Or is that absolute sovereignty? Be careful. Then God absolutely made those men to be in that kind of condition when Paul got there. And Paul had to work with them in that condition. What do you think is the Bible is talking about over there in Revelation, what is it, 10, 5? Out of every kindred and nation, or is it 5, 10? 5, 10, I think. Anyhow, it's one of those two. Out of every kindred. What? There's, there's a lot of kindred in this world. Billy Thomas loved blood pudding when he was a kid. His mama used to pour blood in the pudding and said it really made it good. God saved him from that, and he won't touch it anymore. But they come out of those people down in the islands. That's how he, that's how he was raised up. He wouldn't know any different. I ain't going to drink no blood just so Billy, uh, Bentley Thomas can get saved. But I would not go down there condemning him. It's my job is not to condemn. Jesus said, I came not to condemn, but that the world through me might be Saved. Isn't that right? Oh, my soul. Christianity 
is so glorious and so magnificent, I just wonder, have we ever really found it and really tried it? Uh, we've got our traditions, but this Christianity that this man set forth from Christ is just unbelievable. So you can't, you can't, you can't persuade legalism that slanders you because of prejudice against you with innocence. Don't make any difference. You're going to get it anyhow if God raises this up to you. Now, Luke chapter 23. Let me show you, to me, the exact same circumstances, or kinds of circumstances, I should say, that happened to Paul's sovereign. Luke 23, 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. You, you know that's not true, but that didn't matter. And forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. That's a lie of the devil. He's the one taught Paul to give custom to whom custom is due, tribute to him tribute is due, honor to whom honor is due. He said, they said, Jesus, your taxes are due. He said, go catch a fish. And out of the fish's mouth, some fisherman had dropped just enough to pay Jesus' taxes, and that fish gobbled it up, and that's the one they caught. And he said, get that coin out and go pay my taxes. Does that sound like somebody it's, it's a, 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 that's caught up with sedition and, and, and anarchy? No. He didn't forbid to give, that, but that's what they said against him, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. He is not a king, kid. He is the king. Verse 13, Luke 23, 13. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, you have brought this man to me as one that perverteth the people. That's the charge, right? Yes, yeah, right. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching these things whereof you accuse him. Now, wait a minute. This is a Roman magistrate. This man represents the authority that's over the Jews. And he is bringing down the gavel and saying, not guilty. Now, my point is, innocence will not dissuade slander and prejudice. The court said not guilty. Does that stop the slander? Next verse. <clears throat> he says, I find no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him, no nor yet Herod. Herod or Pilate couldn't find anything. For I sent you unto him, lo, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will there chastise, therefore chastise him and release him, for of necessity he must release one of them at the feast. Now, they said, well, okay, if Herod and Pilate both have said not guilty, then we need to quit. Slander never says that. Prejudice will not have that. It does not matter. If you can excite a crowd by saying, Ye men and brethren, this is the man that said that took a, a Greek into our temple and polluted this holy place, then you can start a riot just with, in, with, with insinuations. That's what prejudice and legalism does. Or if you can say, uh, all, you, all you craftsmen of Diana, this man is preaching everywhere all over across Asia and he's going to destroy the temple of Diana and stop the worship of our great goddess Diana. Then bam, a riot breaks out. It doesn't matter that he's innocent. Next verse. And they cried out all at once saying, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, 
willing to release Jesus. Would you read me the last four words of verse 20 of chapter 23 of Luke? Spake what to them? Again. He's going to tell them again. I've got a second, you know, a, 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 what do you call it when you go to a doctor and you don't like it, go get a second what opinion thing. i got a second opinion. Herod said the same thing. Pilate and Herod agreed. They said, nope, crucify him. They said, okay, I'm going to say to you again. Verse 21. Would you read me verse 21? How you like them apples? And he said unto them the third time, why? What evil hath he done? Again, he's going to say, I have found no cause of death in him. He said it in verse 14, no fault in this man. He said it in verse 15, nothing worthy of death. He says it again in verse 22. No cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Would you think that would do it? And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priest prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder, murder was cast in prison. The courts had said Barabbas was a murderer. They said turn a murderer loose among our wives and kids. But crucified Jesus. And he was the most innocent being that had ever walked on planet earth. Amen. Slander. Prejudice. Coupled together. Legalism. Overriding it all does not care a fig about innocence. They just want you dead. Let me ask you something about the devil. Give me a, a verse about the devil that tells you his character. When it talks about a thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the character of the devil. He's going to always be doing that. But the person who was telling us that he said but I am come that you might have life folks you be careful you keep your head down don't you get involved with this harlot church with these issues that they're screaming and yelling about right now you don't get it don't you march on Washington with no placard don't you get involved with all this junk You've got a responsibility to stay, stay right with Christ, stay spiritual, keep a spiritual mind about you, walk according to the precepts and the counsel of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. You'll be all right. But if they ever get your face in their crosshairs, son, you've got a ride to go, and they will not let you go until you cry to God and God hears your prayer, Lord principalities and angels and powers are subject unto you. God have mercy. You're sovereign over these demons. Put them back in hell. I can't stop them. But the one thing you better not ever do, and I learned this the hard way, but I finally learned it. And then this last ordeal, I, I put it to practice. Thank God for his goodness. Don't answer them. Do not answer them. Well, I owe it to the Lord to stand up. No, no, you don't. That's giving pearls, you know, before swine and casting that which is holy to the dogs. Stay out of it. I decided what I was going to do is what God called me to do. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Be instant out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I ain't going to be distracted from what God told me to do. You stay with the Lord, and the Lord will have to take care of you. Let's finish this out. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Isn't that something? He delivered Jesus to their will. Oh, my soul. Last scripture for today, John chapter 19. 
John 19, verse 13. When Pilate, John nineteen thirteen. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Now you watch out now. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Now, the chief priest were, was the uh, formal agent and spokespersons for the entire Jewish nation. And if they're going to say something in unison and in agreement, it is as much as the Jewish nation signing its name onto this edict. Now, would you read me uh, the last sentence in verse number 15. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Right there, the Jewish nation apostatized. Right there. The chief priests answered for the whole nation. They were authorized to do so. And they said, take the Messiah and crucify him. I don't care if he is innocent. We're so prejudiced against what he looks like, how he came. He didn't come in the package we were expecting. He wouldn't join in our club. He wouldn't go through our, uh, you know, through, through uh, 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 what we wanted him to do to be made what he is. We, we want to have something to do with it. He just, he just come as sovereign Lord, and we don't like it. So crucify him. And I want you to know this, we are apostatizing from the God of Abraham, and we say our king is now Lord Caesar. That's what you're up against. That's what you're up against. They will use Christianity as needful to be able to justify themselves in their slander against you. But they will cast off Christ in an instant in order to have all of their vile imaginations to be realized. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. People ain't going to hell in a good condition. Take the talent from him. What is that? I don't know, but it's everything good that God ever given. And cast him into outer darkness. What's the result? It shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, my soul. Folks, you know, that harlot church ain't just, you know, nice folks that just don't believe in the, the confession of faith we believe in. You're either of the Lord or you ain't. I mean, that's all there is to it. You be careful. Not everybody that talks about heaven is going there. 